in one sense quite amusing to see what high waves uh, the possibility of Italy signing the MOU with China is causing right now. Because, you know, when Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road in 2013 and then proceeded uh, to make treaties with, uh, in the meantime, I think it's 112 countries, uh, an enormous growth developed six major industrial corridors. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative became very quickly the largest infrastructure project in history ever. And the strange thing was that for about four years in the mainstream media in the United States and in Europe, there was practically no reporting about this. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> in a obviously coordinated way, the major think tanks of Europe and the United States started a series of attacks, studies that China is uh, causing countries to fall into the debt trap, that it's just an effort to replace the United States as the dominant force in the world to become Chinese imperialist, uh, that you know the Belt and Road projects are not viable, uh, that China is an authoritarian system, that Xi Jinping is uh, a dictator. So all of a sudden you had a barrage of attacks on, on this concept. The funny thing is that if you would ask and listen to the leaders of the countries cooperating with the Belt and Road on the other side, like the Africans, the Asian countries, the Latin American countries, they would be full of praise and say that with the Chinese cooperation, they have for the first time the opportunity to overcome the underdevelopment and poverty they had suffered as a result of 500 years of Western colonialism and 70 years of IMF conditionalities, which prevented them from exactly having that kind of development. And they were full of praise, calling China a friend. Um, <coughs> so you get a completely opposite view. Uh, I have come to the conclusion that everything the Western media, the mainstream media, are saying about China is fake news and just a lie. And it comes from the fact that many people in the West simply have lost the ability to imagine that any country, leave alone China, could promote something which is indeed for the common good of all of humanity. When Xi Jinping talks about the shared community for the common future of mankind or community of destiny, he means it. And isn't it obvious that in the time of thermonuclear weapons, of international space travel, of you know conquering all the problems of the world, that we have to think about the one humanity first before we talk about national interest. As a matter of fact, the conception of a win-win cooperation um, <coughs> for the Belt and Road Initiative it has all the economic aspects which are beneficial to all the countries who have participated. But it is much more than that because from the standpoint of the evolution of mankind, if you take a step back and don't look at the conflict between Marseille and Trieste, which I understand is obviously very important for the Italians, but if you look at the larger p uh, point of view, isn't it natural that infrastructure development would eventually open up all continents and connect them. Uh, so now all of a sudden you have uh, this eruption of anti-China propaganda, but it comes from the fact that we are now at a point where something happens which happened already 16 times in history, namely that the up to now dominant power is being bypassed by the up to now second largest power. And in history, this led 12 times to war between the, those two competing powers. And four times it was just that the second power bypassed the dominant power without war. China has emphasized many times they don't want, obviously, the 12, uh, to follow the 12 examples where this conflict would lead to war. But they also do not want to simply replace the United States in the role of the leader of an unipolar world. But they want to build a completely new system of international relations based on sovereignty, 
and respect for the different social system and non-interference, actually proposing a completely new international system of international relations. So uh, the big question strategically is you have the conflict between the United States and Russia, which is obvious because of the you know, <coughs> cancellation of the ABM treaty, then the Russian reaction to that, now the cancellation of the INF treaty. So there are many people who think that we are actually close in a worse strategic crisis than during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis because of the relation of the United States and Russia. But, you know, if you talk to some strategic insiders in, in, on both sides of the Atlantic, they easily admit that the much more dangerous conflict is actually the one between the United States and China. Will the United States accept the rise of Asia and, you know, the, <coughs> the, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is just the obvious expression of that. Or is that which was said by the Rand Corporation a couple of months ago, that it's better to have the war with China now than in 10 years from now because the casualties will be less? Well, obviously, <coughs> this is something we have to change. And I think that the best way to change it is indeed you know, to bring in this reality of a new paradigm of thinking altogether. We have to leave geopolitics. We have to leave the idea that there can be a legitimate interest of one country or a group of countries against another block of countries, because this was what led two times to World War in the 20th century. As a matter of fact, I think the potential to overcome this conflict is absolutely there. I know in Europe many people are fainting when you mention the name of President Trump, but <coughs> President Trump is not seeking confrontation with Russia. As a matter of fact, he wants to have an improved relation with Russia, which he proved in the summit with Putin in Helsinki. And despite the present trade tensions, President Trump always talks about President Xi Jinping as his very good friend and China being a great country and, you know, that he wants to actually have a good relationship between the United States and, and China. So the attacks on Italy <coughs> coming from the White House, uh, the Financial Times mentioned this uh, Garrett Marcus, uh, is not representing the same view as Trump. It comes from a faction of the neocons, which are unfortunately also in the Trump administration, but the factual situation in the United States is very divided. You have the Democrats and the neocons trying to get Trump out of office with the Russia Gate. But you know, on the other side, you know, I think President Trump has proven a tremendous uh, um, sustainability against the efforts uh, to to drive him out of office, and his supporters are absolutely backing him and the chances that there will be a, a second Trump administration are actually very, very high. Now, one of the accusations against China and the Belt and Road Initiative is that it would divide Europe. Now, I think everybody knows Europe is divided already without China. You have the North-South conflict between because of the EU austerity policy, which you know impoverished Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, did not give development to the East European countries. So they are now uh, happy to cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative because the EU did not provide these things. Now the second area of division is obviously the migrant issue <coughs> where you have uh, the division between East and West. The East European countries do not want to have any <coughs> part of the proposed quota system of the EU. Now, what Italy is actually doing in this context is really a role model because the kind of cooperation between Italian firms and Chinese firms in the development of Africa is actually the only human way to address the refugee question. So you have right now 13 countries who already signed the MOU with China. Uh, you have now with Italy the first uh, G7 country, which, you know, is, is really overrated because the G7 is no longer that important as compared to the G20, for example. And you have many 
ports, uh, Mr. Geraci said it's actually all the ports of Europe who are already wanting to be a hub between not only the new Silk Road over the land route, but also hubs to the maritime Silk Road, Portugal and Spain becoming the hub for all the Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking countries around the world. So there is a complete changed attitude developing very quickly. There are also, even in Germany and France, uh, the two countries which are now trying to put the brakes on the most, uh, apart from the EU Commission, <clears throat> there are many cities who are absolutely recognizing their self-interest to cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative. You have three states in Germany, Schleswig-Holstein, Bavaria, and Brandenburg, who all the time have huge delegations back and forth. You have many cities where the mayors are complete fans uh, of <coughs> the cooperation with China, and it is an increasing dynamic, which is rapid, more rapidly than you would think. So if you would ask my prognosis, I think the perspective of unifying Europe, not necessarily under an EU bureaucracy, but in the conception of de Gaulle, more like a Europe of the fatherlands, uniting <coughs> with uh, China, with Russia, uh, with the Bed and Road Initiative, the Eurasian Economic Union, and European countries to cooperate fully in this new paradigm is absolutely there. Well, I think that that is also the only way to ha how Europe can impact this strategic situation. Because if you had a united Europe of the fatherlands cooperating with the Belt and Road Initiative, including Germany and France, that would be the best way to get the United States to also uh, give up their uh, opposition, which I said, you know, it's not Trump himself, but these other forces, and get the United States to join the new paradigm. And I think this is the only hope we have to avoid a catastrophe, you know, where we would end in, in World War III with nuclear weapons, meaning the extinction of civilization. So in that sense, what Italy is doing right now is of the greatest historical importance, because Italy, with what you are doing, with the MOU, but also with the joint ventures uh, with China in Africa, can become the role model for all the other European countries. But the new Silk Road is not just an economic concept. Obviously, infrastructure, investment, all of this is extremely important uh, as the backbone, but it has a much more and not so known cultural, um, moral dimension, which uh, I think is, is best expressed in the fact that the Chinese thinking is actually based on the Confucian theory, namely that you absolutely must have harmony about all, among all the nations developing all in a harmonious way. And um, exactly. you know, when some think tanks uh, say that there is now a competition of systems between the Western liberal model and the state guided model of the uh, Chinese uh, state economy, well, what they really mean is that, you know, China has developed uh, its whole policy based on the Confucian orientation, which means that the state is also in charge of the moral improvement uh, of its population through the aesthetical education. As a matter of fact, Xi Jinping has said repeatedly, that he puts the highest emphasis on the aesthetical education because the result of this is the beauty of the mind and the beauty of the soul. Um, <coughs> Quando i, i, i vari centri studi e pensatori parlano di competizione dei sistemi, dimenticano il fatto che la Cina ha sviluppato una politica basata su Confucio e il fatto che lo Stato sia uh, responsabile anche dello sviluppo morale ed estetico del, e dell'educazione dell estetica della popolazione. E questa è una garanzia. Uh, the goal is the beauty of the mind. Oh, uh, e che l'obiettivo di tutta questa politica sia la uh, bellezza della mente. You see, I understand Italian. <laughs> Capisco l'italiano, <laughs> almeno quello che manca. 
so the problem is the reason why some people in the West regard that as a competition is because the Western liberal, neoliberal and liberal philosophy has moved away from that conception. We are no longer humanists. We are no longer thinking like during the Italian Renaissance or the German classical period, but we have replace that with a liberal thinking of everything is allowed. Every degenerate form of culture is, is allowed. Every, everything goes. You know, I don't want to elaborate that, but if you look at the violence, the pornography in the entertainment, you know, we don't have to worry. We will lose that competition of the systems simply because we are not taking care of our future generations, but allowing them to morally completely decay. And that is why, you know, I think that we have to understand that the only way how Europe can persist in the coming future is is not through military power. What Mr. Macron is proposing is, is ridiculous. Uh, but we will preserve our European culture only if we return to the greatest tradition of our own history, meaning reviving the spirit and the ideas and principles of the Italian Renaissance, of the polit Ecole Polytechnique in France, of the German classical music, literature, poetry. Only if we rise again to our best traditions can we persist in the coming world. So I think that the cultural dimension of the new Silk Road is as important, if not more important, than the <coughs> question of economics.